Good evening. Welcome to Newton Baptist Church. My name is Bo. Thank you for joining us today. I am so glad that you took the time to join us for the service tonight. This message is going to help you very much. Pastor is going to be preaching from Philippians chapter number four on the topic of contentment. And this is, (laughs) I tell you, this is a good one. And you're going to want to get your Bible, take some notes, get the family together on the couch. We're going to have a good time tonight. Second, if you're new here around noon, we want to thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to follow along with the things that are going on around noon. You can follow along by liking on Facebook, following on Instagram. We also have an email list where Pastor Tony sends one email each Saturday with a little bit of what's coming up around the church. All right, with that, let's go ahead and jump into the message. Open your Bibles, get ready to study this topic from Philippians chapter 4, Contentment in Christ. It is so good to have you on this Sunday evening. It's hard to believe that we're, what, halfway through January now? This year is already flying by and we rejoice in God's goodness. Um, if you take your Bibles and turn them to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, I'm excited tonight about preaching this thought, uh, Satisfied in My Soul. Uh, I think about a good meal. Yeah, you've got uh, your roast, you've got potatoes, carrots, you've got beans and cornbread, you've got onions and tomatoes and hot peppers, you've got deviled eggs and dessert. Ah, just a wonderful meal. And after just a a wonderful meal, you sit there and you've eaten till till you're just so full and you're just satisfied. You're just satisfied. And so physically, I think people try to reach a, a satisfaction with their physical body. Well, what about within our soul? Uh, how do we how do we reach the point in place that we are satisfied, contented within our soul? See, discontentment is something that uh, will plague each and every one of us if we're not careful. All through the Word of God, all through life, all through history, people have been challenged with being discontent, not being satisfied within their soul. And so, when we come to Philippians chapter four, Paul has given us great encouragement uh, that we should, you know, uh, stand fast and stand firm on the faith, to be in unity and not be fighting, uh, to think on and be focused about the right things, controlling our mind and thinking upon things that are appropriate, appropriate and godly, you know, controlling the thoughts of our mind like we talked about last week. And then we pick up with verse 9. Uh, as you look at verse, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 10, he's gonna talk, he says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care for me hath flourished again, Whereas you were careful, you're also careful, but you lacked opportunity. And then he says this in verse 11. Not that I, respect, I speak in respect of want. He's talking about their giving. He's talking about their care for him. Uh, but he's wanting to clarify something, and he's going to lay out just a tremendous life principle. Not that I, I, I speak in respect of want. I didn't write that because I want something from you. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned... And whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, I know both, he says, how to be a base, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. I can do all things. And you see this verse, uh, athletes, other people use it, and there may be a, a broad application for that, but the beauty of it is this next verse fits with dealing with contentment and the things that we experience in life. Notice what he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Um, and so we look at this this whole thought here. I can do all things through Christ. I can abound. I can be abased. I can suffer need. I can have much. I've learned in my life, Paul says, how to be satisfied within my soul. Satisfied within my soul. And I, I pray that after the, tonight's message that you and I would have some life principles, that we would also have that contentedness and that satisfaction within our souls as well. I've used this illustration before, but it just always amazed me uh, that years ago there was a guy named uh, R- R- uh, Russell Cornwell, Conwell, and he told of an ancient Persian, Ali Hafed, uh, who owned a very large farm. He had orchard and grain fields, gardens. He was a ve- very wealthy and contented man. He was a very wealthy and contented man until a visitor came by one day and began telling him about diamonds and how he needed to have a diamond mine and he needed to go on search for all these diamonds. And you know what, that night after that visitor had filled his mind 
with going and getting those diamonds. You know, Ali Hafed went to bed a very poor man because discontentment had set inside his life and set inside his heart. And uh, the next next day, next week, he takes all that he has. And remember, he's, he's a very wealthy man. He has so, so much. And he sells all that he has to go on this expedition to find these diamond mines, to find diamonds to make him rich. He travels the world over. He goes to and fro, north and south and east and west. He expends all of his wealth in search of these diamond mines, and he never never lay hold on it. He became sad. He became depressed. He, he, he lost all of his wealth. And the sad story, true story, the sad story is he committed suicide. That life had gotten to the point in place that he was so unhappy, so broke, so empty on the inside that he took his own life. The amazing thing about this story is that back on his farm, the guy that had purchased his farm uh, was at the river one day, the creek one day, and one of the anim animals was drinking from the, the creek. And the animal's nose hit some rocks, dug down a little bit, and the, the guy that bought the farm looked down and is like, mm, that's a beautiful, beautiful rock. And he picks up the rock and all of a sudden just a, a prism of color erupts from this rock. And you've guessed it. The rock that that man picked up was a diamond. It turned out to be one of the, the Golconda diamond mine, the one of the most famous diamond mines of hi in history, was on Ali Hafed's land. The land that he sold, the land that he, he, he left and went the world looking for diamonds on his own property was one of the greatest of all diamond mines that history has ever unfolded for you and I. It's just amazing that the man searched the world to find what was already at home. Discontentment settles in within our life. It settles in within our marriages. It settles in within our churches. It settles in within our jobs. See, isn't it amazing that the very thing that we're looking for well, it was right at home in the first place. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had everything. They had the Garden of Eden. I mean, glory to God. What else do you want? They had the Garden of Eden. But Adam and Eve, though they had everything, there was one thing they didn't have. And the one thing they didn't have is the very thing they, they, they gave their life to getting. They, they forsook everything else for the one thing that they did not have. There's a lady in the Bible. Um, her name is Gomer. Uh, her husband was a prophet. He was a preacher. His name was Hosea. And Gomer in the story is amazing that she was a very uh, promiscuous woman, a very free woman, if you follow me. Um, and so she had many lovers, right? And she's like, my lovers have given me this and my lovers have given me that. And there in the word of God, and I'm paraphrasing, the prophet of God says this, and he is an illustration of what God had done to Israel. That uh, the, the prophet, the preacher, the, the husband said, they they didn't give you your corn. They didn't give you your wine. They didn't give you your silver. It wasn't those people that took advantage of you and used you that gave you all this stuff. He's like, I'm the one that gave it to you. And God with Israel, it was like, well, this God did this and this God did that. And the God of heaven's like, you're so silly. They didn't give you corn. They didn't give you water. They didn't give you protection. They didn't give you silver. They didn't give you gold. They didn't give you anything. I, the God of heaven, am the one that gave to you. So whether it's Adam and Eve, Leaving the splendor of Eden, leaving what was perfection because of the one thing that they didn't have, discontentment settling in. A wife named Ho uh, Gomer that leaves her husband Hosea for her many lovers only to realize her one true love was already at home. The prodigal son, oh, he was so discontented. You know the expression in the King James, he went into a far country. A far country is not just a geographical term. It's also a condition of our heart. Anywhere that's away from our Heavenly Father, away from the things of God, can turn into a far country for us as children of God. And the prodigal son's like, I want to get out of this place. Father, basically he says this, Father, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. You're worth more to me dead than you are alive. Give me what I am deserving and I'm going to get out of here. And so the father gave him his inheritance and the prodigal son, the, pro the word prodigal means wasteful. The prodigal son went, wasted his substance with riotous living, ends up in a pig pen. Now watch the principle here. See, with Ali Hafed, he left his place to find diamonds, only to find diamonds in his place. Adam and Eve were looking for perfection of all perfection, and it is amazing that they left that so that they could take the fruit and do what they want to do. Discontentment has settled in. The prodigal son leaves home, and then one day he's like, you know what? 
and I'm paraphrasing, I'm an idiot. What in the world am I doing here feeding pigs, sitting in a pig pen, when my father's servants are treated better than most people? He says this, he says, you know what, I think I'm just going to go home and get things right with my dad. It's amazing with the prodigal son that the very thing that he was looking for was already at home. See, the very thing that he left was already at home. He wanted what? To fill his life. And the very thing that he wanted was already at home. So many people will leave what they already have in search of more, only to come to realize later in life, usually through a lot of pain, that what they left was really what they were looking for. Israel complained so much, so discontented, forgot God, forgot His works, forgot His wonders, forgot His grace, forgot so many things that God had done. We're going to go to these other gods, right? And they're going to do for us, only to, only to realize they weren't going to do anything that the God of heaven is the one that was doing it all for them. See, one man said this, there are 10 rules for getting rid of the discontentment blues. When you and I looking over the fence, feel like we've, we, there's more, there's more, there's more, right? He says there's 10 rules for getting rid of the discontentment blues. 10 rules for getting rid of the discontentment blues. Go out and do something for someone else and then repeat it nine times. I thought, man, that's pretty good. Amen. I like that. And so all of a sudden, discontentment, I've got to get it out of my life. Because see, the Apostle Paul, it wasn't always easy for him. It wasn't always fun for him. But there was a satisfaction within his soul that he didn't have to go looking. He didn't have to go wandering. He didn't have to go searching. There was a rest and a contentment and a satisfaction that rested within his soul that when I'm reading this and chewing on this and pondering on this and meditating on this, I'm like, God, would you allow, I want that peace. I want that rest that tranquility within my soul. And I looked at the, the Apostle Paul, and I think there's principles that um, you can have in your life and I can have in my life when it comes to being satisfied within our soul. See, this contentment brings such a consistency. Uh, Paul was not up and down, in and out. Up, uh, he, he was not uh, uh, a, ther a, a thermometer that was telling you the temperature. Paul was a thermostat that set the temperature. He was one that was so steady in all these things. Look with me in verse 11. He says, I can accept all things. Literally, not that I, I speak in respect of want. I'm not writing this because I want you to send me money. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned and boy, some of these lessons of life, I, I want to learn. Do you want to learn them? He says, I've learned that in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And so it doesn't matter what condition. It doesn't matter what the circumstance. I can learn to be at rest. I can learn to be satisfied. I can learn to be at peace. I can learn to be contented no matter what stage of life I'm in. Whether it's a stage where things are uppity up are lower than low. I can have this satisfaction in my soul by resting, relying, and trusting on the God of heaven. Paul said this, it doesn't matter what state or condition that I'm in, I have learned to be content. He says, I can accept all things. And then he says, I can do all things. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can endure all things because of Jesus Christ that is in me. I can, I can encounter all things. I can do all things. I can experience all things. I can do all of this. Why? Because of Jesus Christ, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Christ on the inside, residing and abiding within my life, as long as, as God is with us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that's within me than he that's within this world. We throw out these Bible verses. Paul lived them and experienced them. And he says, I can accept all things. It doesn't matter the circumstance or the condition. I'm not going to be, be uh, swayed by these. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have my temperature go up when it's really good or have my temperature go down when it's really bad. There was such a consistency within Paul's life that I yearn for in mine. And then Paul says, I can I not only accept all things, I can do all things. I can endure all things things. Why? Because Christ is with me. It, because God's right here with me. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. Because as long as I've got Christ, as long as I've got God, not only can I accept all things, not only can I do all things, I have all things. He says in verse 18, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent uh, from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Oh, what contentment and rest satisfaction that settled upon the Apostle Paul. So may I pose this question to you. How satisfied are you within your soul? 
Because if you're not satisfied within your soul, uh, if I ask these next questions, this ought to be the same answer. If you're not satisfied in your soul, are you satisfied in your marriage? Are you satisfied in your job? Are you satisfied with your kids? Are you satisfied with your finances? Are you satisfied with your spiritual life? Are you satisfied with where you are in life? And so the questions can keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. And I'm challenged with this. When I'm not satisfied within my soul, I'm not satisfied with anybody or anything else. My dissatisfaction with others or things is just a mirror for Tony to see that I am so dissatisfied within me. Hurting people hurt people. What is on the inside has a way of affecting everything on the outside. Paul was able to minister, to endure, to love, and even to give his life for the cause of Christ because there was such a rest and a peace and a contentment and a satisfaction on the inside. Contentment. The word content it has the idea of being contained, uh, a, a, a self-sufficient, self-contained person. What that that could almost sound egotistical. Watch the context of what I'm saying. That we would be self-sufficient, self-sustained, sustained, not in ourself, but Christ in us. That I do not have to have the outward stimuli to do for me on the inside and in my life what Jesus Christ does. I'm thinking, okay, if I, I, I'd be happy if I got to go to um, Hawaii. If I got to go to Hawaii, Hawaii, I'd be happy. If I got to go to the mountains, I would be happy. Um, I, I do like snow, to be honest with you. I don't think we're ever going to see it in Georgia. But uh, I hear about Wisconsin. I hear about some of these other uh, Aspen, Colorado. I hear about just some neat places when it comes to snow. And I'm like, you know what? If I could just have a snow vacation, if I could just have a jacuzzi and the snow and the ski, or with me, I'd probably do a snowboarding so I didn't break my leg, but uh, our snowmobile, oh man, you know, if I, if I could just get to this place, I'd, 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 I'd be satisfied. I'd be happy. I'd be, I'd be content. They did a survey years ago. And so the numbers may be off a little bit, but it was, the, the principle is quite amazing. They did a survey and they asked the, the American, the, the average American household. And at this time, the average American household that they, they, they um, uh, polled uh, was $25,000. So it's been a few years ago, uh, but it was $25,000. And they asked them for them to be able to experience the American dream for those, um, uh, a household of $25,000, for them to experience the American dream, what would it take? for them to be able to experience the American dream. And as they polled these, these different individuals, uh, the, the resounding results were, if we could just make 54,000, if we could make $54,000 a year, we could experience the American dream. Well, the, the crazy thing, now this is during the same time period, uh, those that said 25, made 25,000, if they could just make 54,000, they could experience the American dream. So the next category they asked were those that made right at $100,000. And they said, uh, you make $100,000, what would it take for you to experience the American dream? And the resounding results, the average was, if we could just make $192,000, we could experience the American dream. The American dream is usually about twice as much as we, use, as we have right now. That if we have twice as much, we could experience the American dream. The sad thing is, is those that have that already, they still haven't experienced the American dream. Contentment is a place of rest within our soul, satisfied within our soul. And Paul has laid out beautifully these things of how to be satisfied within our soul. Paul's like, man, I've had good days. And I've had some not so good days. I have had some great food. And there's been days I've not had any food. I have been treated like a king. And I've been treated like a servant. Whatever state I'm in or whatever I'm experiencing in life or whatever I have in life, it's not the outward stimuli that brings satisfaction to my soul. It's who rests there. See, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Christ is the one that brings me strength because he's the one that abides within my life. And as long as I have Christ... Paul has come to the point in place, great maturity, great strength in the faith. As long as I have Christ, is there anything else that I really need? And so we know, we, we as Baptist preachers, we as Christians, we say, glory to God, no, there's not anything else we need. As long as I have Christ, there's nothing else I need. And in my life, I would preach that to the, to, I could paint the, I could, I could preach the paint off the walls on that. He's all I need, amen, he's all I need. And then there's a little Holy Spirit inside my heart and life going, psst. You know he's all you need, and you preach that, but is he all you want? 
See, I, as, as a believer, I know that he's all I need. As a human, is he, all, is he all I want? And that's where my discontentment comes in. And Paul, his spiritual side and his fleshly side, had become one in the sense that Jesus Christ was all he needed. And not only was he all he needed, it was really, he was all he wanted, that I may know him. It was, was the, the cry of Paul, the desire of Paul. There's such contentment within his life. So real quickly, my time is running. Oh, my goodness. My time is running away. Let me give you just some things about contentment from the, this passage. Contentment does not concentrate on things. If I concentrate on things, I will never look at what I have. I will always focus on what I do not have. I always enjoy my car until another car nicer pulls up beside me. I enjoy my house until I go into somebody that has one that's bigger or nicer, one with a pool or whatever it may be. I'm very contented and like what I have until it is compared to something that somebody else has, has that I would deem as better, bigger, are, are more expensive, right? And so all of a sudden, I've got to look and ask myself, what is it that really brings me contentment? All right, what is it that brings you contentment? Uh, are you, uh, well, I'd be content in my marriage if my husband lost 10 pounds. I mean, really? If my wife lost 15 pounds, really? I mean, I'd be satisfied with my kids if they made this, 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 this kind of grades, really? Isn't it amazing with our relationships, our life, our possessions, our families, our churches? Uh, that we have all these different um, stipulations that, yeah, you know, I'll tell you what, if, 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 if our pastor was like this, well, like what? Uh, pastors are like, if my people were like, like what? Like what? And so all of a sudden we find in every area of our life, relational, possessional, we find in every area of our life, we find that our contentment is so uh, attached to, to, to the things that go along with those different elements. And contentment does not concentrate on things, Paul says, I'm not speaking as respect of want. My life is not built around the things that I want. I want this, and I want this, and I want this. Uh, if you have children, that uh, all they do is incessantly tell you all the things that they want. I want this. I want. This. They'll drive you crazy. If you have a marriage that the husband or the wife, they're all about what they want, what they want. I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. They'll drive you crazy. And so all of a sudden we find in the believer's life, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I wonder if God, you know, and this is just imagery, okay? I wonder if God looks down and says, Tony, you want everything but me. See, I wonder if God feels like in my life at times that if I had all these other things and didn't have God, that I'd be okay with that. But I'm not okay with not having all these things and having God. I wonder. So it's a challenging thought. Contentment does not concentrate on things. And, and Paul says, not that I speak in respect of want. Uh, First Timothy talks about but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness and contentment, it's amazing how those two things work together. Because now the opposite of contentment would be covetousness. And what do you and I find out about covetousness in the Bible? That is, it is likened unto, there's the word, it's likened unto idolatry, isn't it? And so godliness and contentment, they're going to be teammates. They're going to work together as we're growing in our faith with the Lord. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith, he says, content. And, um, uh, and But verse 9, but they do it will be rich. What do they do? They fall into temptation and a snare. Because our desire to be rich is so elusive that we're never going to reach that. Because once we reach one element, one level to be rich, then we're going to want the next one to be rich, right? Because this is not rich because I have it. See, rich is always something that's beyond us. Those that would be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. They do some crazy things for the sake of possessions, money, things, right? Uh, which drown men in destruction and perdition, judgment uh, within their life for the love of money. Now, money's not evil. Okay, please listen closely. Uh, I hear people say, and I think they mean well, right? But uh, money's wicked, money's evil. Money is not. Money is a tool uh, that you and I have to be able to advance and further the cause of Christ. Uh, money's a tool. It's just a tool. Now, the love of money, that's what the verse says. For the love of money 
is the root of all evil. Why? Why is the love of money the root of all evil? Because the love of money is what spurns and breeds within our life covetousness. And covetousness is, is uh, one of those things that goes into so many sins of us trying to fulfill and get what we want to within our hearts and within our lives. And so he says right here, for the love of money is the root of all evil, uh, while, uh, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith. They, they've left the faith in search of money. You see some of that going on today and pierced himself through with many sorrows. And so he's warning us against these things uh, that would hinder our soul. And so contentment does not concentrate on things. How much of your day is focused on things? How much of your day is focused on your bank account or your savings account or your investments? Now, understand this. In business and as stewards of God, those things we will deal with as we're trying to further the cause of Christ and to be good stewards. So take all this biblically, okay? But when it becomes the pervading thought the prevailing thought, the things that permeates our hearts, souls, and minds, when it becomes that one thing that makes our heart beat and everything else is attached to it, that's where you and I have got to be careful. And so contentment is not focused on things. Contentment is a choice we make. I choose whether I'm going to be content, satisfied, uh, okay with what God has given me within my life, what I have around me, uh, what God has blessed me with. He says, I have learned. Paul's like, I've gone through some lessons in life. And there's some things that I, I would pray that we would be able to help people with as they're, as they're growing in the Lord. And then I realize this. I realize there's some folks that are going to only learn it through experiencing it. And Paul's like this. Can I tell you at the end of life, as I'm getting later on in life, can I tell you what I have learned? I have learned by experience that wherever I am and whatever I'm going through, that I can be content, at rest, satisfied, and at ease because I have, I have found that my God is greater and bigger and larger and more important than anything that that is around me. Contentment is a choice that you and I will make. He says this, he says in Luke 3, then came also publicans to be baptized and said to him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded him of him saying, and what shall we do? You know, what's required of us? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. That blows my mind. That's like, okay, I don't know. Does that fit? Wow. So God's like, understand this, contentment not is not in the things that we possess. It's in who possesses us. Contentment is a choice that we make. And not that we shouldn't better ourselves or seek a raise or any of those things. No. But he's like, there is an element within your life of being contented and being satisfied. He says, be content with your wages. And so contentment is a choice that they had to make and that I have to make. Number three, contentment does not concentrate on things. It's a choice that I make. And number three, contentment is not controlled by circumstances. Paul's like this. He knows, he's, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and all things. I mean, the wording that he uses in verse 12, it encompasses the north, the south, the east, the west. It encompasses everything. He says, I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Uh, Paul had learned to live in poverty. Paul had learned to live in prosperity. Paul had learned to live in easy times. He's learned how to endure through hard times, difficult times. He has been hailed and praised, and he's been stoned and left. Paul is like, you know what? I have lived enough life to know that God's faithful, to know that my satisfaction doesn't belong in the, in the, in the things that I have. Satisfaction and being contented within my soul is a choice that I make. I know that my circumstances cannot bring me satisfaction, contentment, and joy. Why? Because my circumstances can change just like that. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ on, let's just for, for sake of illustration, Jesus Christ on one weekend, they are laying down palm branches, they are Hosanna in the highest, they are rejoicing in Him, they are praising Him. It's one weekend. And by the next weekend, they crucified him. You know, our circumstances, I got to be so, so careful uh, of allowing my circumstances to dictate the satisfaction that I have within my soul. Why? Because, uh, you know, it could be a good day. And just like that, it could be a quote unquote bad day. And I, I don't know what I'm going to let deem what a good day is or what a bad day is, but my circumstances can change so very quickly. Your circumstances can change uh, rather quickly. It's amazing what one phone call will do. 
It's amazing what one phone call. It's, it's amazing what one day will bring. Uh, got just a dear friend, just a dear friend, a dear family um, that's going through just some amazing stuff. And uh, we thought that all this going on would not hit uh, close to home. But we have dear people uh, that uh, passed away, uh, that have been hit with sickness, uh, people that have gone to the doctor and found out about cancer, uh, people that have found out about their children. Uh, uh, just this last week, uh, someone found out their daughter, young, not, not even teens, uh, has leukemia. And so uh, it's just amazing. Our circumstances are crazy, aren't they? I mean, it can just change so quickly. And Paul's like this, uh, I'm not going to let my contentment, my satisfaction, I'm not going to be controlled by circumstances. It's not going to be controlled by things. I'm not going to let everything out here. Now watch closely as I close. I'm not going to let, and this is hard, this is difficult stuff. It's good truth. It's, it's not easy to live. Paul's like, I'm not going to let everything out here dictate what's going on in here. Contentment. I, I've learned my circumstances change like that. What I have or don't have, change like that. My safety, change like that. One, one city, they're going, he's a god. You worship, right? The next city, they're like, he's a jerk. And they're throwing rocks at him and want him dead. Paul's like, I want you to understand something. I, I have learned, and I want to help you, that everything going on out here, it cannot dictate what's going on in here. I can do all things. I can endure, experience, and go through all things through Christ, the one that abides and lives within me because he's the one that gives me my strength, my satisfaction, and my contentment. See, Paul had learned this lesson, and I want to learn it. I'm trying to learn it. I'm not at Paul's level. The contentment comes from abiding in Christ. See, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And contentment comes from my relationship with Christ. My contentment doesn't come from what I possess. My contentment comes with who possesses me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it doesn't come from my circumstances and situations here. Uh, it comes from knowing that I have a home in heaven with him there. Um, it's not in, in who I am or don't have, uh, who, I, who I am or not. It's not uh, who likes me or not. It's not what I have or not. Um, it's all because of who I am in Christ Jesus. And I know that sounds preachery. I know it sounds, you know, super spiritual, but it's really a truth that Paul has just nailed in his life. And while you and I have such dissatisfaction, wandering eyes, looking and coveting and desiring, oh, we may not say it with our mouth, but in our heart it beats with covetousness. Paul's like, I have contentment, whether it's up or down, in or out, uh, prosperous or poverty, it doesn't matter. I've learned to make the choice that based on who I am in Jesus Christ is where my satisfaction and contentment is going to come from. I can do all things through Christ. I'm going to abide in Christ. One man said, soul rest is found in only one place, seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And that's where Matthew 6 comes in, an excellent passage. Uh, for you to read. But he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. See, all the things that I'm looking for, I'm just like the prodigal son. I've left home and don't realize what a wonderful father I have. I'm just like Adam and Eve, wandering from the garden, only one day to wish I was back in the garden. I'm like, well, I'm like a gomer, looking for love, if you will, looking for love amongst all the wrong places when love has already been given. It's so amazing for you and I as believers that we are leaving the farm blessings and wealth that God has given us for our diamond minds. Only sadly to maybe realize one day, hopefully before it's too late, that the very thing that we were looking for had already been provided right where we're at. And Paul had learned, no matter where I am, no matter what I endure, and no matter what I have, I'm a rich man because I have Christ within me. I know how to go through every experience of life because I know who is going with me. So contentment does not concentrate on things. Contentment is a choice that we make. Contentment is not controlled by circumstances. And contentment is going to come from a body in Jesus Christ. So I ask this question, all right? I ask this question. How satisfied are you in your soul? How satisfied are you on the inside? Does contentment, is that a word that would describe your life? And if you find discontentment is eating your lunch, write down what are you looking for? Because you may not even know what it is. 
And then once you find out what it really is, what you're gonna find out is you already have it because it's in, our sufficiency is in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for walking through the book of Philippians. We have maybe one, two more sermons left in Philippians. I so appreciate you watching the service this evening. Would you pray with me, Father? We love you so much. I pray that you'd bless God's people. I pray that you'd bless all those that are watching. We are so blessed to have such a great live stream family that tunes in service after service after service. Thank you, Lord. They don't have to do that, but thank you that they do. And I pray, God, you would bless them. And Father, that you would open up my eyes, their eyes, our hearts, and help us to see, Father, the provisions that you've already given. God, you are so good to us. And we want to take time and thank you for that goodness. Help us, Lord. Lord, to be satisfied within our soul. If we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. I love you, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night. May God bless you and your dear family. One of the biggest things I took away from that message is that if we do not have satisfaction, contentment on the inside, we won't have contentment anywhere else. And that starts with Jesus, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and a personal faith in Jesus Christ. If you have questions about what it means to be a Christian or anything that was discussed in this message, if we could pray for you, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us through the connection card. You can find that link there in the post or in the comments section. Fill out, give us a way to get in touch with you, and we'd love to reach out to you and talk with you about your walk with Jesus Christ. Until next time, may God bless you. Have a good week.